Guys, I'm going to read a, a, a pretty common story in the Bible. Most Christians and non-Christians know this story pretty well. Uh, it's the story of David and Goliath. It's a pretty long section, so you know, bear with me. I'm not the best reader. <laughs> no, uh, I've gotten better since, since I started reading the Bible. Uh, but So I'm going to be in Samuel, 1 Samuel 17, and it says, The Philistine now mustered their army for battle and camped between Saoch, sorry, Socoach, Socoach, and Judah, and Azekah, at Ephesus, Damien. Saul countered by gathering his Israel troops near the valley of Elah. So the Pharisees and the Israelites each faced each other on opposite hills with a valley between them. Then Goliath, the Philistine champion, came from Gath, came out from the Philistine ranks to face the forces of Israel. He was over nine feet tall. He wore a bronze helmet. His bronze coat mail weighed 125 pounds. He also wore a bronze leg armor. He carried a bronze javelin on his shoulder. The shaft of his spear was heavy and thick and weaved a weaver's beam, was heavier and thick as a weaver's beam. Tipped with an iron spearhead that weighed 15 pounds, his armor bearer walked ahead of him carrying a shield. Goliath stood and shouted and taunted across the Israelites. Why are you all coming to fight? He called. I am the Philistine champion, but you are only the servants of Saul. Choose one man to come down here and fight me. If he kills me, then we will be your slaves. But if I kill him, you will be our slaves. I defy the armies of Israel today. Send me a man who will fight me. Then Saul and the Israelites heard this, and they were terrified, deeply shaken. <coughs> now David was the son of a man named Jesse, the Ephorite, from Bethlehem, in the land of Judah. Jesse was an old man at that time, and he had eight sons. Jesse's three oldest, were, three oldest sons were Eliabib, Abad, uh, Abinadab, and Shimea, had already joined Saul's army to fight the Philistines. David was the youngest son. David's three oldest brothers stayed in Saul's army, but David went back and forth so he could, could, he could help his father with the sheep in Bethlehem for 40 days every morning and evening the Philistine champion strutted in front of the Israel army one day Jesse said to David take this basket of roasted grain and these 10 loaves of bread and carry them quickly to your brothers give these 10 cuts of cheese to their captain See how your brothers are getting along and bring back a report on how they are doing. David brothers were with Saul and the Israelite army at the Valley of Eli, fighting against the Philistines. So David left the sheep, the sheep with another shepherd and set out early the next morning with these gifts as Jesse has directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the Israelite army was leaving the battlefield with shouts and cries. Soon the Israelites and the Philistine forces stood facing each other. Army against army. David left his things with their keepers, with the keeper of the suppliers, and hurried out to the ranks to greet his brothers. As he is walking with them, Goliath, the Philistine champion from Gal, came out from the Philistine ranks. Then David heard him shout. His usual tent taunts towards the army. As soon as the Israel army saw them, they began running away in fright. Have you seen the giant? The men asked. He comes, from, he comes out each and every day to defy Israel. The king has offered a huge reward to anyone who kills him. He will give that man one of his daughters for his wife, and the man's entire family will exempt to pay taxes. David asked the soldiers standing nearby, what will a man get for killing the Philistine and ending the defiance of Israel? Who is this pagan? The Philistine army, oh, the Philistines 
any way that he allowed to defy the armies of the living God. Sorry. Who is this pagan Philistine anyway that he is allowed to defy the armies of the living God? As his man gave David the same reply, yes, that is the reward for killing him. But when David's older, older brother Eliab, Eliab heard David talking to the men, he was angry. What are you doing around here anyway, he demanded. What are those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know about your pride and your deceit. You just want to be seen in the battle. What have I done now, David replied. I was only asking a question. He walked over to some others and asked them the same thing and received the same answer. David's question was reported to King Saul and the king sent for him. Don't worry about this Philistine, David told Saul. I'll go fight for him. I'll go fight. I'll go fight him. Don't be ridiculous, Saul replied. There is no way you can fight this, Philist this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy, and he has been a man of war since his youth. But David persisted. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats, he said. And when a lion or a bear comes to steal a lamb from my flock, I will go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from its mouth. If the animal turns on me, I'll catch it by the jaw and club it to death. I have done this to both lions and bears, and I will do this to this pagan Philistine too. For he has defied the armies of the living God. The Lord who rescued me from the claws of a lion and bear will rescue me from this Philistine. Saul finally consented. All right, go ahead. And may the Lord be with you. When Saul gave David, then Saul gave David his own armor. Bronze helmet, coat, mail. David put on, strapped the sword over strapped the sword over it and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things before. I can't go in these, he protested. Just all, I'm not used to wearing them. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream, put them into a shepherd's bag. Then armed only with his shepherd's staff, sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistine. Goliath walked out towards David with a shield bear ahead of him, sneering in contempt at this ruby-faced boy. Am I a dog, he roared. David, that you come at me with a stick? And he cursed David by the names of his gods, by his little gods. Come over here and I will give you, and I will give your flesh to the birds and the wild animals, Goliath yelled. David replied to the Philistine, You come at me with sword and spear and javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of heaven's armies, Amen. the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today the Lord will conquer you, and I will kill you and cut off your head. And then I will give your dead bodies... I will give the dead bodies of your men to the birds and wild animals. And the whole world will know that there is a God in Israel. And, ev and everyone assembled here will know that the Lord rescued his people, not with a sword and spear. This is the Lord's battle, and he will give you to us. As Goliath moved closer to attack David, quickly ran to meet him, reaching into his shepherd's bag, and taking out a stone, he hurled it with his sling and hit the Philistine in the forehead. The stone sank into Goliath, or sorry, and Goliath stumbled and fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with only a sling and a stone. He had no sword. Then David ran over and pulled Goliath's sword from its sheath. David used it to kill him and cut off his head. All right, you guys with me still? Yeah. I know it's pretty long. I, I do apologize about that. But, uh, a lot of people don't know that story. You know, I get some youth in my class that don't know that story, and I was like, well, what an opportunity to teach you know, an iconic story. 
And that's what it is. It is it's an iconic story. Like, this is what put David on the map. You know, he was just a shepherd boy before this. And that's where he found his identity. See, <laughs> it's hilarious. So, David was a shepherd, and he spent a lot of time with God. He talked with God. And there was another king at this time, King Saul. You know, he was the first king of Israel. He was anointed as king. He kind of didn't have a backbone and, you know, sometimes didn't depend on God. He was still a good man, still did great things for God. But God, he had a better relationship with someone else. And he wanted to anoint them as king. So Samuel comes and anoints David as king. And he's the youngest of eight, right? And, and his dad doesn't even bring him up. He don't even bring <laughs> David up whenever Samuel asks for his sons to be anointed king. Because he's like, he's just nothing, he's nothing special. You know, he's just a young boy. He's out there with the sheep. He's, but, Lord behold, because of David's relationship, Samuel anoints him as king. And because of his relationship with God, he had a, a very fine trust in God. Whenever he was out there alone in the stars and a lion would sneak up or a bear would come and attack his sheep, you know, he had a flock of sheep, right? That's kind of a big deal. He would go after a bear or a lion, and I don't know anybody, hunters out there, if you've you know, fought a bear or lion this week, last week, any time? No? Nobody? Yeah. It, it would take some seriously tr serious trust in God to go after a lion or a bear and, and club it to death with your bare hand. You know, like, well, club and hand, you know, whatever. Uh, and and when it, whenever David's walking up to, to meet his brothers, you know, he, he hears this guy define his God, the person who he had a relationship with, the person who he found his identity in. He was being defied by this giant, this manly man, this masculine man that just towered over him. And he's walking across there and he's going to meet his brothers and he's like, what? Oh, no. Not my God. Not Yahweh. Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Not my God. Not today. And his brothers just think he's just trying to be there to like show up and be like, you know, I'm part of the battle. And Saul, Saul hears this and goes and sends for him. And what's funny about this story is, before this, David was a harp player. Not a very manly thing, you know. I wouldn't think. So imagine, like, you're a king, and you're a small servant boy that plays the harp for you, you know, because you're enticed by an evil spirit. And it's, you know, he soothes you with his harp. It's like, hey, I'm going to go kill that guy. I can do it. Like, I, 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 my God will save me from this. And he's like, no, nah, you're just a boy, man. Like, you go over there and you practice your strings and it'll all be good. But before this moment, David had been prepared for anything that came his way. And this was just like, this was just what put him on the map. Like, the, David went on to go do so many things. You know, Saul found favor with him after this battle. He, he takes him into his household. He becomes like blood brothers with Saul's son. David becomes a great warrior. He's anointed. You know, God's with him and everybody can see it. They sing songs about him of how great of a champion he is. And Saul tries to kill him. Spends years chasing after him. David's hiding in caves, you know, with his enemies. Like, he's just like, he's hiding here and there. He's running from Saul. Finally, Saul gets killed. Uh, David's anointed king, and he, he makes mistakes through there. You know, if you've, anybody's read David's story, you know, he wasn't a perfect man. He was a man just like every one of us. But through all this, through all these little things that I'm telling you about, the relationship between David and God, it stayed the same. Whenever he was a shepherd boy, he found his identity in God. Whenever he killed Goliath, he found his identity with God. Whenever he was king, he found his identity in God, not, be, not because he was king. His status never defined him. It was right here, constantly. And, and what the devil wants you to do, like his, his job's so easy nowadays, like we, it's, 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 a, it's a trick. He's, he's tricked us by the world. Like he doesn't want us to think about God. He wants us to worry about our taxes, our financial situations, if the rent's going to get paid, if our water's going to get shut off, you know, if we're going to have electricity or Wi-Fi next week, right. you know? Like, here's the thing. Satan does not want you to worship him. There's a satanic Bible out there, and, it, and it's not, 
You know what, what the common theme of the Satanic Bible is? Is to go do you. Go do what you desire. Feed yourself. Make yourself happy. Do whatever makes you happy. And what do we see in, in the second book of the Bible? In the very beginning parts of the Bible? Satan shows up. He tells Eve, it don't matter what God has to say. You go do you. Go do you. That looks good. I bet it tastes good too. He didn't ask Eve to worship him. You know, he didn't ask her to go carve out an idol. He just asked her to go and, and do her. Don't worry about God. And, and right now in America, you know, that's what we're witnessing. You know, I would be a liar if I stood up here and told you I didn't feed into my selfish pleasures, you know, to make myself happy every now and then. Um, you know, I'm a man of fault. But, but whenever, I, whenever I figure out my sinful nature is behind this, and I know that Satan's trying to defer me, <laughs> I will stand up to Satan every time. I'll stand up to my sinful nature. I'll stand up to whoever and whatever. I'll let him know that I serve Yahweh, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that whatever struggle I'm going through and whatever struggle you guys are going through, God's going to be there. Just look around. I mean, He's going to be there. And, it, it, and, if you, and if you are getting overwhelmed by the world and, and you're not focusing on what you know, the Bible has to tell you on, on your relationship with God and stuff like that, you're, you're going to find yourself, you know, I found myself at, you know, by the age of 20, I had figured out this world's games and gimmicks and I was tired of it. You know, you can't find satisfaction in, in relationships and drugs and alcohol. Like, you can't find satisfaction in, in your career and your talents and your abilities to do things. The one thing that gave me identity and that fulfilled my satisfaction was when I cried out to God and He answered my prayer. As, a, as an unserving, did not serve God, did not go to church, had never read the Bible, I'd prayed to a God that I'd only heard about. <laughs> and He answered it. <laughs> he answered it. So undeserving. Yeah, that's why, every, you know, every day I just strive to to keep that relationship with God, no matter what's going on. You know, I have things that go on constantly that, that try to derail me. And, and I'm just like, no, I'm going to turn on praise and worship and I'm going to sing your praise. My soul will sing your praise. And that's just what I ask you guys. Like, if you guys aren't, if you guys don't have a good relationship with God, it can change today. You know, we all have glass in our, in our lives, big things, that, you know, that are going to derail us that we think is standing in the way of God and you can change that God can change that and he will you know I'm, I'm living proof of it you know I, I'm not perfect and you know I don't want to stand up here and brag but yeah you know, I, I was fooled by this world you know I didn't I didn't think about God and I got a lot of people in my life that, that are fooled by this world they're, they're good people they're really really good people excellent people but they don't make time for God and it worries me. You know, I, I, I read stuff in the Bible that, that worries me about people like that. Um, if, if you can throw up Matthew chapter 7 for me, Randy. Hey, I don't know if I put it on there. Okay. I read stuff like this in the Bible and it, and it worries me for unbelievers. And believers alike, too. Not everyone who calls to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father will enter. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name and we cast out demons in your name and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply to them, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. Jesus wasn't just talking about unbelievers. He was talking about people like me, like Jim, like Francis Chan, Joel Olstein, you know, people that were involved in the church, people that were doing good things, people that are doing good things. I don't want to stand up here in front of a church 
and, and get you guys to fall in love with church or to fall in love with praise and worship. I love praise and worship like so much. Like <laughs> I have to put myself in check sometimes and make sure that I'm not praising to, this, to the music, but actually praising to the Father in heaven. Amen. Amen. And, and that's, what, that's what I want to do this morning. You know, I, I want to invite you guys to have a relationship with God like He's there. He's right here. And all you have to do is invite Him. Guys, I thank you for coming to Wild Church, for listening to me babble on. And <laughs> but, but invite Him. Allow God to be a part of your life. You know, he, he's, he's blessed me and, and, and allowed me to be discipled under you know, a great man and have a great life. But, but even whenever things weren't great and things, things were hard, <laughs> God was still good. That's why when I get up here and I say God is good all the time, and y'all tell me all the time, God is good. I live it and I breathe it. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I, I really believe it. And, I, and that's what I want from you guys. It's just to believe that even whenever things aren't right and things aren't good, God still is. Amen.